Uh, what are we talking about? There was something you said inside. Was... Oh, yeah. Moral of the story is you can make millions of dollars and not have to do it unethically. Right. Okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, cause I'm fucking, like ripping and tearing and fucking, so. Just kidding. I know. I'm just kidding. I sleep at night. And Remember, your me. iPhone is listening. Oh, yeah. I tried that. It never worked out. It's about incentivizing the behavior. Your payroll is going to go up, right? And performance should go up with it. Results should go up with it. You want to create a structure where performance-based pay helps the company become more productive so people can actually earn up. You know, somebody who wants to work the loopholes can work the loopholes in any system, right? Well, guys, here we are. Another great cigar, another great bottle of whiskey. What are we drinking this time around? We are drinking uh, your namesake, your home, your homeland. A little Sazerac. New Orleans. Yeah. A little Sazerac uh, rye. Pretty sweet on the palate. It's uh, it's got a heck of a good flavor. It's very mellow. Very mellow. You, you know when I was that? yeah, I think we had this on a previous episode. We yeah. have had to had to make a uh, encore. Encore uh, yeah. appearance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. McAllen 18 is making an encore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I was a kid, 16, 17, living in South Louisiana, uh, in Slidell, we had this area called Old Towns where all the old bars were. And there was a band that always played down there we'd sneak and go see. It was called Sazerac, named the band. That was my first introduction to like, well, Sazerac. Then I realized it was very famous whiskey made around town. Yep. So nice to bring that in for a nice homey touch. Yeah. Got to take care of you, man. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. So guys, I was sitting around thinking about what we ought to talk about. And I was thinking about, I want to talk about something beautiful. And Drew's hair came to mind. And I thought, well, as beautiful as it is, it's not much of a topic. We can cover that in about two seconds. Nice hair, as always. Uh, but what I did want to talk I'm about I'm getting ready was, for hockey season. Yeah, hockey, hockey's coming back. Hockey's right? coming back. Me and Barry oh, Melrose. You get Barry, Barry Melrose. Me and Barry Melrose. Barry Melrose. Yeah, Melrose. Yeah, I got the, a little bit longer. You, another need more, you need more product if you can do yeah, Barry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> little, another month or two of the COVID thing, I, I got them all going. I'm ready. <laughs> Another month, month or two of the COVID, I'm going to jump out of my, my treehouse and land on my head. Uh, but uh, that's all behind us now. So tonight, today we're going to talk about uh, incentive-based pay, right? Attaching uh, performance-based pay, I guess is a better term for it, but attaching compensation to productivity and performance. And so, Gary, I was thinking maybe you could lead us off today and give us kind of the 20,000-foot perspective on why it's important, kind of the philosophy behind it. And then let's get down into some particulars on sales and management and, 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 and how that looks from a tactical perspective inside a contracting company. Yeah, it's a great topic. We've been seeing a lot of questions through the membership, through uh, Contractor Connect and through Ask the Experts. Uh, obviously, a lot of information on the site as well. But, you know, per per performance-based pay is uh, uh, kind of misunderstood in a lot of ways. Um, you. You don't want to be using performance-based pay as a way to reduce your payroll costs. You want to create a structure where performance-based pay helps the company become more productive so people can actually earn up. Um, so I think that's kind of the first philosophical thing that we would want to talk about. Maybe second is uh, every position in a company can be on a performance-based pay type system. So uh, you can have technicians, install crews, uh, plumbing, plumbing supervisors, uh, electricians, et cetera, but also customer service, your service management function. Um, any business owner knows that we're performance-based. So if the company doesn't do well, we probably don't get paid very well. So what you want to do is you want to align the way you're paying your people with your business plan goals, those objectives. Um, so there's a lot of details that go into performance-based pay, you know, um, things like tracking the time for overtime and those types of things. You still have to do all those things. So I think that's a misunderstood concept as well. People oftentimes think, well, if I go to performance-based pay, I'm going to get in trouble with you know, the state or the, the federal uh, overtime laws. Um, and the reality is, is it's no different in tracking from the time point of view that you would normally do. The difference is we're just going to tie it to production. So lots of ways to skin the cat here. There's no one right way to do it. Um, generally speaking, 
you can pay a percentage uh, you know, of a, a transaction. Salespeople are paid on performance, by the way. I mean, we're, and we're all good with that. Uh, I think our contractors in our membership struggle with the idea of structure, how to do it. Like what's the technical side of, you know, how do I keep track of the pay system? Uh, how does it integrate with uh, QuickBooks? Or in some cases, how doesn't it integrate with QuickBooks? I and mean, that's, that's the struggle. And, you know, from a performance point of view, uh, it's about goal setting as well. So if, if Drew is my service manager, uh, I'm gonna wanna set that up where he's, he's gonna be paid some salary uh, because he's responsible for a lot of things but I'm gonna set him up to be paid off of like the gross profit dollars that his division produces. I can set him up with some goals on service agreements. I can set him up with opportunity leads, you know, for lead turnovers, things like that. So there's a lot of ways to set the goals so that people can get, you know, earned income or compensation uh, that tie back to the production. Uh, but I, one of the things I can suggest is that it really, it, it's, it's the way you should approach the reward systems from a pay, point of view in any company uh, because of the simple principle that it creates uh, alignment with the goals of the business owner. So everybody is rowing the canoe the same direction at the same speed when that's happening. If Drew's my service manager and I'm only paying him on salary and he's not producing well, he still gets paid and the company is you know eating that expense. So we, we want to set up systems that allow people to earn up and earn based on productivity and goals. And then uh, you figure out the systems and processes that are underneath it. So I mean, that's, that's a 50,000 so, foot viewpoint. So when we talk about this, a couple of really interesting points there that you made, I, th I think probably one of the most important for guys and gals to understand, it's not about reducing your, your payroll expense. It's about incentivizing behavior. Your payroll is going to go up. Right, and performance should go up with it. Results should go up with it. Pay pay would only go up if production went up. Right. Which, and if we're producing well, then we're winning, right. and then therefore the employees win. Is it always for every position based on gross margin, or are there different uh, benchmarks for different people in the company? Yeah, that's a phil philosophical thing. Um, I, I like the idea of the gross profit dollars. Um, Overhead in contracting is, is moved forward or up by overhead, uh, but by labor. So one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to get locked into a percentage. 50% um, of $10 is $5. If the overhead is $10, I have got a great margin percentage, but I lose. I've lost money. Uh, on the other hand, if I sell $100 and it happens to be 30% uh, margin, which would be a lower margin, but it produces $30, that same $10 overhead, I made $20 of EBIT. So I like the philosophy of looking at the gross profit dollars and setting the targets based on the productivity of GP. Uh, and uh, so again, let's take that back to overhead. Two thirds of most contracting business overhead uh, are fixed. So if Drew's the service manager and he's doing a great job of you know, getting the guys to, to produce well, uh, and he's producing a lot of extra gross profit dollars, I really don't give too much concern to a lower margin percentage if he's surpassing his goal because most of my overhead is fixed. So once we've covered the nut, we're actually doing very well. And so I think the trick is, is that you need to set some goals for what your gross profit targets are. And that's a tricky part for a lot of contractors to create the budget. One of the things, and uh, Drew, I'd like to get your perspective on this. Uh, we talk about uh, performance-based pay for service techs, for example. And what I've always recommended uh, and done in my own companies and other companies is when you go from hourly to flat rate, I always tell the guys, the first 100 days, keep track. I'll pay you whichever is more. Because there's going to be a certain percentage of them that get it and go out there and they perform better, hustle more, and they make more money. The ones at the end of that 90 days that are still making on the hourly, they're probably not a good fit, right? But one of the things I always hear from contractors, I'm sure you guys do too, that, oh, that's just going to create a problem because now my service techs are going to take advantage of people. Right, to try to make more money. And I always say that's that's a that's a like a character issue. That's not a systems problem. Right. That's you got a bad apple. And if that guy is gonna take advantage of your own homeowners on piecework or percentage work, what do you think he's doing to you on hourly? <laughs> right? That's a character issue. What are your thoughts on that, Drew? No, I agree hundred percent. I mean, you know, somebody who wants to work the loopholes within any system will work the loopholes in any system, right? Correct. And I think contractors tell themselves a story that they get okay with because they they understand wage an hour, right? Works an X amount of time, 
pay for X amount of time, right? Like you said, it doesn't matter that the guy's milking the job, you know, that he did it. He did a, a four hour job in eight hours, right? Or, you know, did it in four hours, but put eight hours down on the time card. One, one way or another, right. you know, that technician worked that system. And will they work a performance-based pay system? Yeah, they'll try and find a, you know, the, the, you know, the loopholes around it. That's where, you know, we come back to, you know, culture and leaderships and systems and processes and procedures and core values, right? Uh, core values will determine whether or not that person, uh, you know, is somebody that stays on the team. Here's what I see in most companies where this becomes a, a big problem is nobody ever goes out and checks on, on these people. They never go out and they do, they never do a ride along with the technician. They never go out and just drop in on the technician. They never go out and drop in on installers. They rarely do sales, you know, salesperson ride alongs in companies and cut, cut. Yeah. We'll yeah. come back to it. All right. That's good. That's good right there. We have to come back to that. Bye.